We read in Exodus chapter 5 from the first verse. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. But it require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. May God bless his word to our hearts. We also read some verses from Psalm 105. Verse 5. Remember the wonders he, that is God, has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abram, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. Then at verse 23, Then Israel entered Egypt. Jacob resided as a foreigner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes, whose hearts he turned to hate his people, to conspire against his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark, for had they not rebelled against his words? He turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die. Their land teemed with frogs which went up into the bedrooms of their rulers. He spoke and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. They ate up every green thing in their land, ate up the produce of their soil. Then he struck down all the firstborn in their land, the first fruits of all their manhood. He brought out Israel, laden with silver and gold, and from among their tribes no one faltered. Egypt was glad when they left, because dread of Israel had fallen on them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God of all the generations, covenant-making and covenant-keeping God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his blood that sealed the everlasting covenant of peace. 
And we thank you that we who believe are the children of Abraham, the spiritual children of Abraham, and heirs to all his covenant promises. We pray that you will draw near to us today as we think of this glorious mystery. And we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts to understand the secret of your covenant. We commit to obeying you in the name of Jesus and by his grace alone that we may enter more and more deeply into that holy covenant and give you the glory for all that you have done in the past, all that you are doing in the present and all that you will accomplish in the future. We thank you that Jesus who came as the lowly man of sorrows, will return once again as the king of the ages, as the king of glory, as the judge of all the earth and indeed all the universe. And we will sit with him on his throne. We thank you for that glorious destiny which is ours in Christ. So we lift up our hearts to you and we praise you and we confess to you our sins, our neglect of this glorious covenant promise that you would be our God and we would be your people. Forgive us for neglecting your holy word. Forgive us for not believing your word. Forgive us for not obeying your word. And forgive us the many other sins that blight our lives. And bring us once again to the cross to receive full and free absolution. A new hope, a new grace to begin again, to fight the good fight and to shine for Jesus Christ in this dark world. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go. Let my people go. There's an interesting movement in the United States of America called Hashtag Walk Away. Essentially, it is a movement, a political movement, of people who were involved in the Democratic Party and have become disillusioned with that party because of its lies and hatred and intolerance and unforgiveness of those who do not agree with their world view. Unforgiveness of those who do not agree with their world view. Not only do these disillusioned people walk away from the Democratic Party, but they are plucking up courage to make a short video of why they are walking away. And they are telling the world the truth as they see it. Now, I don't understand American politics, but I would think that the true Democratic Party in times past would not be like the present Democratic Party. For it should be possible to disagree with another person's political viewpoint without writing them off. The other thing I'm picking up is the unforgiveness. We are seeing the same unforgiving spirit in the cancel culture of our times. The cancel culture says, if you offend me, even unwittingly, I'm finished with you. You are cancelled. And anyone who sides with you is also cancelled. Make one mistake, or what I deem as a mistake, 
and you're out and there's no way back. You see, that spirit, that attitude is so unchristian, so ungodlike. It's actually a devilish spirit. We're up against the devil in human hearts when we are up against an unforgiving spirit. And that's what Moses was up against in dealing with Pharaoh and with the gods of Egypt. You can see that in Exodus 12, verse 12, where God says that he is uh, judging the gods of Egypt. You can also see it in Deuteronomy 32, verses 36 to 39a where Moses sings about God's deliverance from the false gods, the idols. And, of course, behind the idols were the demonic powers, behind the gods of Egypt, these demonic powers. And they had a cruel hold, not only on the Egyptians, but on God's people. And they were not going to relinquish their supernatural hold without a fight. And even though it was the word of God saying, let my people go, these uh, demonic riffraff were not going to easily let God's people go. The almighty word of God was declared in all its uncompromising authority, let my people go. But deliverance from such perverse evil, from such entrenched evil, from such persistent evil, would involve all-out spiritual warfare and demonstrations of the almighty power of God. We are thinking here in Earth Church of 2020 as a year of all-out war on the evil, lying, defeated spirits who are opposing Christ in our lives and in our parish. Ephesians 6, 10, following. In order to defeat them, we need to walk away from the worldly world and from the spirits behind the idols of our age. Walking away from these deceitful spirits is another dimension of spiritual fight. And when we walk away, we need to tell the world that we have walked away and why we are walking away. Walking away from the lies and the mob mentality and the unforgiveness and hatred and intolerance of goodness and purity and of life. Let my people go. Let my people walk away from Egypt and all the idols of Egypt. Let my people walk away from all the idols of this worldly world and serve the Lord and worship the Lord only. However, my main point today is this. Even after the liberating and all-powerful word of God has been declared, there is an all-out struggle with the powers of evil behind the evil people. They don't let go easily. That's where the persevering prayers of all the saints comes in. Where your persistent praying comes in where covenant praying comes in. We say, this person is God's covenant child. So, you wicked spirits, let him go. Let her go. This situation of bondage, bondage to lies, to atheistic ideology, to hedonism, that is living for pleasures, this uh, uh, situation of bondage to self-salvation of every kind, whether it's uh, making science your God or religion your God or philosophy your God, all of that is a stronghold of the devil. So we, as the Holy Spirit leads, 
demolish it by the truth of God's word and by prayer in Jesus' name. That's what Moses did at the Lord's bidding. But it took ten plagues, ten judgments, ten operations of divine power to demolish the stronghold of Pharaoh's hard heart. Then he let God's covenant people go, go to fulfill their covenant destiny in the promised land. Even that was a fight, for the whole adult generation of the Israelites would not believe God and obey their Lord. And they all died in the desert, and the second generation entered the promised land to fight again the giants and the evil inhabitants and subdue them in some measure. You know, I've seen people resist the Spirit of God and harden their hearts for years. Only the final judgment upon them enables the Spirit to break through and enables them to hopefully die believing and at peace. But oh, that the whole of their lives would have been for God. So let's not be discouraged, but let us believe God's covenant promises and let us make our inspired covenant declarations. As we say, Satan, let go. And let us persevere in faith and prayer, knowing that God must fulfill his covenant word. It may come to pass long after we leave this life, but it will come in God's time. God must be true to his own word and to himself. This has greatly encouraged me in my prayers over the decades as I have prayed for revival. The Spirit is surely inspiring such prayers, and they cannot be unanswered, even if the answer is long delayed. I mean, long delayed, humanly speaking. The Israelites did eventually enter the Promised Land, and they experienced revival. They slipped away from that revival under Joshua, And only centuries later, 800 years later, did the covenant people of God experience what we might call full revival under David and Solomon. That was the nearest they got to possessing the promised land and being a holy light to the Gentile world. But you know, for the Jews the natural spiritual descendants of Abraham, for the Jews as a believing people when they come back to believing in their Messiah, another revival is prophesied. And my understanding of Romans 9, 10, 11 is that the Jews as a nation will be converted to Jesus and that will have a worldwide impact. So, we pray for the Jews. Let God's people go. We pray for every Christian in the world. Let God's people go. I'm so aware that the time is short. Thinking of our own situation here on earth. I could have retired a couple of years ago and have taken things easy, as could others. I could have opted out of the spiritual conflict and not continued to pray earnestly and perseveringly about needy people, about Christ's church, about the world's lostness. 
But I'd rather cry out to God and fight the good fight as long as God gives me life and strength. He cares, so we must care. He cares for our souls, so we must care for the eternal salvation of souls. And part of that caring is praying. Paul says in the close of the warfare passage, Ephesians 6.10 following, he says, pray for me. Pray that I may speak the word of God boldly. Pray that the Holy Spirit will empower my utterance and that what I say will reach the hearts of the people I speak to. We pray the same prayer. Finally, we have heard this week of a terrible, tragic incident in Beirut. An explosion that has killed more than a hundred people and injured thousands and caused immense damage to property. But what was the cause of this horrendous human tragedy? It seems, as far as I can understand, it seems at the moment anyway, that the reason for this explosion was mostly due to neglect. What one reporter called criminal neglect. What we might call sinful neglect. The ammonium nitrate, a chemical which is a fertilizer, but also can be an explosive, had been stored in a workhouse, a ware, sorry, a warehouse for years. And despite many warnings of the danger of storing it in that way, nothing had been done about it. Neglect. Criminal neglect. Sinful neglect. I want to suggest to you that the Church of Jesus Christ in Scotland, and I mean all denominations, and by the Church I mean all believers, but I mean you and I, we are guilty of sinful neglect of God's all-powerful word and especially of his covenant promises. God says, I will be your God, and you will be my people, a treasured people, a holy people, a distinctive people, a spirit-filled people, as we were saying last week, a people who have spiritual and moral impact on their generation. But we have neglected to be God's people. And we have neglected God himself. This sin of neglect is especially wicked in the light of our covenanting history. And the thousands of men and women who laid down their lives for Christ in the killing times. Around 1680 to sixteen. 88. We, as a nation, entered into covenant with God in 1638, what we call the National Covenant. And there were other covenants as well. And you know, that's only a few generations ago. We think, as Christians, not in terms of uh, the last few years, or even the last few decades. We think in terms of the last few centuries or the last few millennia. In fact, we think in terms of eternity. So that's only a few generations ago when we think in covenantal terms, as we must think to be true to God and his word. 
Who knows what disaster may be just round the corner? A disaster that could be avoided if you and I would confess our sinful neglect of God's word, of God's everlasting covenant of grace, and if we would obey the only king and head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, his commands are not burdensome. Even if a costly obedience is indicated, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So then, beloved, let there be no more neglect of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glory of the world that you have given us. So beautiful, so full of tenderness and loveliness. A world that we can gaze upon and be refreshed by just viewing. And we know that these flowers tell us of your gentleness, of your softness, of your understanding and sympathy. And so we pray, Heavenly Father, for all who are in bondage, for those who are addicted to substances or to love or to uh, evil, we pray that they might find liberation. We pray that they might hear your word, let my son go, let my daughter go. And we pray that they may engage in the fight and in the fullness of time, by the power of your Holy Spirit, experience more and more of their freedom in Christ. Heavenly Father, again we pray for those in sore distress, those who have had sudden afflictions, not least a terrible disaster in Beirut. Have mercy on the people there, and in all these things, may people lift their hearts to you, the God of the universe, the God who cares, the God of the cross, the God whose Son died for us, that we might have life and peace and eternal bliss. Hear us now as we make our own individual prayers, and as we take in the the beauty, the glory of your creation. Thank you for hearing all our prayers. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being our God forever and ever. Thank you for your covenant of everlasting grace. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's coming soon to take us home. In Jesus' name, amen.